Thank you for joining us. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar, U.S. State Data Protection Law Roundup for 2018. In today's webinar, our presenter will cover how over the last 12 months, at least 10 states have promulgated such protections and how each presents unique challenges to data protection professionals. We'll discuss legislation from Ohio, Colorado, Vermont, and others which merit serious consideration when updating data protection programs. And our presenter will compare and contrast these laws and offer insight into what they mean for your data protection program. Let's go ahead and get started. At this time, I'd like to present our, our speaker. Joining us is Scott Giordano, a highly regarded data privacy attorney with over 20 years of experience and currently a vice president of data protection at Spira. Welcome, Scott. Thanks, Doug. So I'll go ahead and hand the presentation over to you. Sure, wonderful. Wonderful, thank you. I want to welcome everyone to uh, this presentation here. And uh, so what is our agenda going to be today? Well, first, uh, I'll talk about the things that I think that you should leave with if you leave with nothing else from this broadcast. We'll uh, talk about different statutes. I've grouped them into three buckets. Statutes that address data security standards, statutes that regulate the sale of personal information, and then we'll talk a little bit about breach notification. I think it's really important to understand that these statutes run the gamut of requirements. These are not just breach notification statutes, and even the ones that are, are more than just breach notification. They cover data security standards as well. So the good news, if you want to call it that, is all 50 states now have breach notification laws, and in cost, D.C. has them, so that's great news, but there's so much more than that. And then uh, I will give you some closing thoughts on how you can comply. And if you have questions, send them on in. I know that we've got a lot of questions at registration. I will get to as many as I can. If I don't get to them, then definitely uh, send me your email address and I'll just email you back. So with that, we've got a bazillion slides. I'll do the best I can to get through them without sacrificing quality. So let's do the first one, which is the scope of these statutes goes beyond states' borders. So. Think about if you're doing business in state X, we'll say Ohio, for example, even though it protects Ohio residents, it's really going to apply to any organization that is processing the personal data. So it's in all other 49 states and territories and so forth. So it's not just if you are located in a given one of these states, you have to comply. It's really about the residents of the state. And in many cases, the state government has to comply with these. In many cases, nonprofits do. So it applies to a lot more than you might think. What you're seeing here today, and it's something I've wanted to talk about for a while, is that you're seeing here is the, the first wave of state data uh, protection regulations, because I think the states have pretty much given up on the federal government ever changing anytime soon our privacy protections here, a la GDPR. So the states really have taken it upon themselves to do so greater than others. So as a consequence, data inventories are key. If you've been on any of my webcasts, you know how important data inventories are, because if you know where the data is, you can't comply with these regulations. You're just, you're gonna get killed when you have a breach and you find out from a third party, you know, anonymous or someone like that posted on YouTube or on some channel and says, hey, guess what, we got you guys. That's not the time to learn about the data you, you have and didn't realize you had it. So with that, let's get fired up on the first one. So these are statutes that address Data security standards, uh, with Ohio leading the way here. Uh, so let's jump right to Ohio, Doug. And this is the Ohio Data Protection Act. I really love this, and I'll tell you why. First up, it provides an affirmative defense against tort claims stemming from a breach of personal data. So what's an affirmative defense? An affirmative defense, for all of those of you that are not, are not um, part of the legal profession, that is when uh, you uh, get into, into court, either civil or criminal court, and if you can show this defense to show that certain state of facts are the case, then you essentially get off, if you will. That's the nicest way to say it. So it provides a permanent defense. So if there is a tort action because you had a data breach and you've got um, one of the, the prescribed data security standards in place, you get it an affirmative defense. You get it a get out of jail uh, or get out of a lawsuit free card or perhaps a jail, get out of jail free card. So that's an affirmative defense. It's unique, but believe me, I, I guarantee we'll see more. Um, if this applies to a covered entity, which is a business, but also applies to nonprofits and interestingly applies to chartered financial institutions. So you're going to find that in many of these regulations, they apply to government agencies and nonprofits. Ostensibly, this applies to everyone in Ohio. They don't come right out and say it, but that's the, the implication. 
So let's go to the next slide and we'll dig a little bit deeper into this. So the, the heart of this is this slide here, which says that the entity must uh, create, maintain, and comply with a program that contains controls and that adheres to one of these following standards. And if you've spent any time in InfoSec at all, these are probably all familiar to you. There's a lot of different standards here. And the net net of it is that if you adhere to any one of these, or it looks like if you, if you adhere to PCI plus another framework, and you can get a third party to attest uh, that yes, you are doing it correctly, then you get that get out of jail free card, that affirmative defense. Now you might say, gee, Scott, some of the, the bar on these things are pretty high. And, and I agree, the bar is pretty high on a lot of these. But the good news is that if you're planning on doing one of these programs anyway, now you have an excellent opportunity to pitch it to the CFO and say, hey, we need funding for this. So that's the good news about this. And again, this is the first of its kind. I'm very impressed with it. Let's go to the next slide, Doug, and we'll dig a little deeper in some other things. I thought what was funny is that uh, then the statute goes on to, to say that the program must do the following. It must protect security and confidentiality, protect against threats and unauthorized access. I think it's kind of implied in using those standards, but for some reason they felt they had to tell us twice. So take that for what it's worth. What I really like about this is that this law is going to inspire other states to do the same thing. There's no question in my mind other states will say, hey, these, we're just going to copy and paste these from Ohio, and if you adhere to these, any one of these, again, you get your affirmative defense. So you're going to see that spawn more undoubtedly in 2019. It's a great, again, from my view, this is probably one of the most cutting-edge laws we have, and it's great that Ohio advanced it. So um, that's uh, my thoughts on that. Let's go over to Colorado, Doug. And so um, this is um, the Colorado Data Protection Act. And um, what's interesting about this is that this also applies to government agencies, apparently applies to nonprofits. A lot of times these things uh, will talk about government agencies by, by default. They'll say government agencies are included, but they'll imply that nonprofits are involved. So as a general rule, if you're a nonprofit, you're likely going to have to adhere to these. And if we go to the next slide, I'll, I'll dig into some of the, the guts of this. There's typically three things you have to do with this particular statute. You have to implement and maintain reasonable security procedures and practices. So you just saw that Ohio had eight examples of that. It's not saying you have to adhere to everything in those standards because they're very, it's a very high bar. They're saying uh, implement, maintain reasonable security procedures and practices. You're going to see that phrase copied and pasted into other statutes as well because the states just look at one another and just copy and paste from one another. So you're going to see things almost verbatim. So if you see um, language in the statute verbatim, it's not an accident. One state just copied it from another. Second thing is that, and I like this, if you're providing a third-party service provider with this, then you've got to require that they maintain security standards procedures, and presumably at least as strong as you, although they don't come out and say that. So this is very common now among these new statutes is they're requiring you to require your third parties to adhere to the same standards. In the defense contractor world, if you come from that, we, we call this a flow down. I'm starting to see that phrase show up in, in non-aerospace worlds as well. Also requires you to have a written policy for destruction of proper disposal of personal data. What's interesting is that you're, you're seeing that as a separate requirement above and beyond our regular security procedures and practices. So they're calling that out separately and saying, hey, you have to have a policy for destruction or proper disposal of paper and electronic documents. So I like that, and uh, that's a common thread that runs through a lot of these statutes. So actions required. Got to report breaches. This is primarily not a breach notification statute, but it includes that. So report breaches within 30 days. If you're GDPR compliant, you're already able to do that in three days anyway. Um, if it impacts more than 500 residents, then let the state attorney general know, and if more than 1,000, call the, uh, the big three credit reporting agents. This is enforced by the AG's office. There's no stated private right of action. And a private right of action is essentially a license for you as a private citizen to hire a lawyer and go sue someone based upon a violation of a state or a federal law. Here, there's no stated private right of action, but there's this idea that you could do a, a lawsuit under state deceptive or unfair trade practices theories. And that's common in most states that I run into will have that capability. So even if they don't give you ability to sue out and out, you can still use an un unfair trade practices theory to do that. And that's a very low bar at clear. Sorry to interrupt you. A question here from a, a participant. So for yeah. the Ohio affirmative uh, defense, perhaps 
also applying to, to uh, Colorado. Must the organization actually have an independent attestation of conformance with the selected security standard? Yes, you're not going to be able to self-certify on that because there's an inherent conflict. So you will have to have a third party be able to do that for you. There's all kinds of companies out there that do that stuff. So that's not difficult to find, but you definitely will need that, which is not surprising. It's rare that you can self-certify for something like that. Um, in fact, I think outside the defense industry, I'm not even aware of, of self-certification. So yeah, you'll have to have a third party assist you with that. Great. Thank you. Any other questions, Doug? Not at the moment. Okay. So this is the Nebraska statute. And uh, it's an amendment to the financial data protection statute, but really it covers all personal data. What's noteworthy about this, and I have this in red, is this applies to businesses, business entities that own, license, or maintain computerized data. So when you hear the word maintain or see it here, maintain, keep in mind that's cloud service providers, that's third parties. So that means that it's not just if you own or license the data, but if you've got access to it because you're maintaining it, then you're going to have to notify your, your client. And I would likely recommend you do it without undue delay because you're likely going to be violating one of your contracts with your client anyway, which you know, I've written enough of these things usually requires you to, to notify them without undue delay or in the most expeditious manner possible or some certain language like that. So that's what's really, I don't want to say unique, but it's special about this, this regulation. And if we go to the next slide, we'll dig a little more into the requirements here. You're going to find a common theme as we go through these in so many of these because they've copied from one another. Implement and maintain reasonable security procedures and practices. Require by contract, so they actually add by contract that the service provider, your third parties, implement reasonable security procedures. So much like the previous one in Colorado, but now it says shall require by contract. So they mention that. And then they talk about specifics appropriate to the nature of the information, reasonably designed, blah, blah, blah. So you're going to be seeing this on and on and on throughout our discussion today. They use the same language, but they're always saying the same thing. And that is that if it's appropriate to the nature, it means that you've done a risk assessment. There's no other way that you wouldn't know if you didn't do a risk assessment. So they're implying that here. Some of these statutes would actually tell you flat out, do a risk assessment. But if you see appropriate to the nature language, it means you better do a risk assessment. Otherwise, how are you going to know it's appropriate? So enforced by the AG's office as a violation of consumer protection, common theme here, no private right of action. Presumably, you could do a state tort action uh, using uh, consumer protection, but uh, it, that wasn't even implied here in what I read in the language. Let's go to the next state. This is South Carolina. If you are in New York and you're addressing the New York NYCRR Part 500, this is largely modeled on that. Actually, it's largely modeled on the National Association of Insurance Commissioners model, which tracks NYC Part 500. So if you've been on our webcast before about NYC or Part 500, you've seen this before, and it's applying to insurers or domiciled in South Carolina. And so it protects the residents there. Now you may say, well, that's great, Scott. Why do I care? It's only South Carolina's insurance companies. This standard is likely going to show up in other states. And in fact, I was speaking with some folks in the know, and they said that probably 18 other states are going to implement this in the uh, coming year. As soon as the, as the uh, Congress folks come back from break and all the states, uh, they're going to start uh, pushing this in their respective legislatures. So you're going to see this spread like wildfire throughout the country because it's based on the NYC, uh, which is effectively going to become a national standard. If we go to the next slide. I'll dig a little bit more into this. You've seen this story before, again, if you're familiar with New York. So I'll hit a couple of these items. One, uh, it says flat out, conduct a data protection risk assessment. So there you go. There, it doesn't even apply. It just comes out and says it. Then number two, it says designate someone to be responsible. So they don't come out and use the word CISO, but they're essentially saying, hey, you need someone in charge. So a security director or the equivalent or a CISO. And then number six, I like, uh, provide personnel with cybersecurity awareness training and update periodically. That's crucial. You have to have that as part of your program. In fact, if you have a cybersecurity program without training, I don't see how it can be effective and I don't see how we stand up in court. So highly recommend that, that you think a lot about training. As I've said umpteen times, if you've listened to any of these webcasts, that, that the best information security control ever invented was, was an alert employee. And it's true because they're the ones that see this stuff even before you do oftentimes. Let's go to the next slide and um, we'll hit a couple more highlights here. So exercise due diligence in selecting third parties. 
no other statute I've run to tells you to exercise due diligence. It may be perhaps it's implied, but they're telling you go exercise due diligence, which means some kind of a questionnaire. And if you've been on the receiving end of questionnaires or perhaps you've gotten hundreds of these things, you know what a joy it is to have to respond to them. Also have a written information incident response plan. If you have an information security plan, you likely have an incident response plan and you have to certify annually. So nothing unusual about that um, as well. A couple of questions from uh, participants. Sure. What is sure. the best approach to developing a single holistic approach to privacy assurance and protection of personal information that can comply with all the various regulations? Any suggestions? Yes, what you're talking about here is, is really rationalizing all your requirements. And so uh, there's two things. One, you need to be on the security side and one on the privacy side. Um, at the moment, we have what's called GATP, Generally, Generally Accepted Privacy Principles. So think of that as a roadmap. If you, uh, if you go to it, the AICPA publishes it. They do a very good job with this. It's a pretty big document. It really goes through 10 key areas that you should address as part of a, of a privacy program. Then I would pair that up with a generally recognized security standard. So think about your favorite standard. Maybe it's CST top 20. Maybe it's ISO 27,000 series, or if you're doing business with the government a lot, maybe it's a NIST 800-171. But I would pick a favorite one. There's One's not better than the other. Pick a favorite one and implement it well. Use the GAPP and pair that up because you want to address the privacy issues, not just the security issues. Privacy is going to have a lot to do with, with who you're sharing information and how you're tracking it, how you're policing it. And that's not really well handled by traditional security regimes just because they're, they're geared to security. They're, they're geared to keeping bad guys out of your network, not, not policing your third parties. And your third party is your biggest problem in, in my experience. So that's what I would recommend. Excellent. Another question is, do these state regulations apply to companies based in Canada who have client personal information lost in a data breach? It's, it's a very good question. And here's the challenge that we say is that in many cases it's implied that it applies outside the U.S., but they don't come right out and say it. And the, the most notorious example of this is the CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act, that essentially says unless your business is wholly outside of California, you're subject to this. Well, what does wholly outside California mean? Well, that means that uh, if you're from another jurisdiction and you're doing business anywhere outside of California exclusively, great. Otherwise, you're, you're part of it. That implies that Canada and the UK, and if you were in my earlier webcast this morning for the UK, uh, you got the bad news that the CCPA has global applicability. Um, does that apply to all the states? It's a tough call. As a practical matter, if you're a Canadian business and you've got operations in the US, say that you have them in Florida, for example, but you doing business, you're directing business to California. In theory, if you've got operations in Florida, then the California long-term statute can come and get you and essentially get your operations in Florida indirectly, even if they can't go to Canadian courts. Now, there may be uh, compacts that we have or treaties that we have with Canada or with other countries that allow you to access those courts, but presumably you don't. If you're a Canadian and you're operating in the U.S., one state will likely be able to reach out and get you in another state. So um, that's the danger that you face, especially if you're doing business in California, which likely you are. Great. Can you repeat the document with the 10 key areas uh, for the privacy sure. program? Sure, sure. It's Generally Accepted Privacy Principles, GAPP. If you just Google that, you will find it. Um, the AICPA and the CICPA, the, uh, the Canadian flavor of the American Association of, of CPAs, published this uh, probably about oh, almost 10 years ago now. So it's been tested over time. Um, just Google GAPP or, or Generally Accepted Privacy Principles. There's also a Privacy maturity model that the same organization has published that it's really nice. I don't think people have used it very much, but it's excellent. So I recommend you Google both, download both, and use that as part of your, uh, your privacy half of your uh, data protection program. Great. Thanks. Um, one of our participants adds that guidance can also come from for designing a data protection program from the Data Privacy BS 10,012 or 2017 or ISO 29,100 or the on the data security side, ISO 27001. Thoughts? Yeah, that's true. Okay. That's excellent. true. Absolutely. And that's why I don't support one over another. It's more important that you take one that you like and execute it well 
then pick one that someone tells you, you they think is the best. It's much more important to just take whatever you've got and execute it well and show that you've done your work with a third party attesting to that hard work. Excellent. No other questions. Okay. All right. Well, we'll go to the next one then. Tie off uh, uh, South Carolina. Now, what's interesting here in South Carolina, 72 hour requirement to report. So if you're GDPR compliant, you've already been there, or if you work for the Department of Defense, you're, you're already compliant likely because they have the same standards. 72 hours is also true for the NYC Part 500. And you're going to see the 72 hour creep in over time just because the 30 and 60 and I think 45 day limits we have in some cases just aren't very helpful. I mean, you can do an enormous amount of damage in that time. So I think over time, you're going to see 72 hours become the magic number. Uh, it won't happen overnight, but it will start creeping in. And I'd be ready for that if you aren't already. So let's go to our next state in line, which I believe is yes california okay sb 327 this is the first of its kind folks at least to my knowledge and essentially what it does it says that if you're a manufacturer of internet connected devices that you've got to build in security to them and i'll dig into exactly what that means so it applies to any manufacturer so think about all the manufacturers that are producing internet connected devices so if, if it's got an ip address or a bluetooth address i'm sorry bluetooth address it's internet and think about all the companies around the world that make equipment and they sell into California. Well, now all of those folks in just slightly less than a year, slightly more than a year, have to comply with that. And it's designed to protect California residents. Think about all the horror stories you hear from routers that are 10 years old that people are still using and the bad guys are just bypassing them because they can't update the firmware. It's, it's a huge problem. And so this was an, an attempt to fix that. If you go to the next slide, we can dig into some of the specifics here. So two big things you got to do. One is ship uh, devices with reasonable security. And you may say, well, you Scott, isn't that obvious? And the answer is, I wish it were obvious. But you've got manufacturers that are absolutely shipping devices with zero security. I mean, like nothing. And in fact, I think one, there was a doll, I forgot the name of the doll's name, but it was banned in the EU or at least banned in Germany because it had zero protection and it was internet connected. It was a mess. So um, that's something that you have to be done. And then two, and this is really the problem here for manufacturers, is that you've got two options. Either you've got to put a unique password to every device, which no one wants to do because that's a huge amount of overhead, or make a security feature that forces you um, to generate a unique ID or a unique um, password to that device the first time you use it. That's likely what they'll do because that's easier to do. You just force someone to, to change that. That's something that they should have been doing a long time ago. The problem is that you have people that install routers and they don't really realize what they're doing and they use password or something like that and the bad guys can get right past it. So uh, this is a huge issue and um, this is creating a lot of consternation among manufacturers, but it's um, first of its kind. If we go to the next slide, a couple caveats here, um, no duty by ma upon the manufacturers once a third, you know, you've installed third party stuff, there's no, there's no responsibility for them to do anything on behalf of the third party software or hardware. No duty to prevent a user from getting full control. So if you're a Linux geek and you want to get the hands-on imperative and really get to the bits and bytes, there's no requirement to prevent you from doing that. Um, there are some couple exceptions I'm not going to dig into for law enforcement. Let's go to the next slide though. I want to dig into some final thoughts on this. Penalties here, there's no private right of action. The AG or the city attorney or county attorney or local attorney can go and enforce this. And what is important here is that if you uh, haven't read Click Here to Kill Everybody, the whole book is really about IoT security, Internet of Things security. Highly recommend it. If you haven't read it by now, go get a copy and read it. It's brilliant. I'm a big friend of Bruce Schneer. I see him at the conferences, at the security conferences. Highly recommend it. It's all about IoT security, not about necessarily the bits and bytes of fixing things, but more about the policy issues that we have here. So please do take a look at that. If you get an opportunity, I have a copy. Highly recommend it. Let's go to the next state. So these three states here, these are statutes that regulate the sale of personal information. So let's go right to Vermont, because Vermont has a first of its kind requirement. And this is a requirement to regulate data brokers. And so a data broker is someone that buys and sells personal data with someone with whom they do not, and, and you, here I've emphasized that, they do not have a direct relationship. So it's not just 
potentially people, in, or I'm sorry, vendors inside of Vermont. Presumably, you could be outside of Vermont and you could have the personal data of a Vermont resident and could be selling that. You have to register with the state now. So this is very interesting. Again, first of its kind. If you go to the next slide, Doug will talk more about the details of this. So what you've got to do is you've got to register with the state as a data broker. So again, this only applies to data brokers. If you're buying and selling data with people with whom you have no relationship, this applies to you. If you're buying and selling data of your own customers, that doesn't qualify for this particular statute, hence the name broker. So you've got to register, you've got to disclose to consumers the data that you're collecting and selling. And if you offer them an opportunity to opt out, you show them how to do it. If you don't, tell the, the Vermont Secretary of State that you're not giving them an opportunity to opt out and give them very specific databases information and just details about the data that is not opt out the bull, if you will. And then, like many other statutes we're talking about this hour, uh, maintain comprehensive information security program with appropriate safeguards, et cetera, et cetera. Also, having one or more designated employees to maintain it. So again, there's the implication of a CISO, and then it gives you things like employee secure use, user authentication, et cetera. It's uncommon for a state to give you specific controls. They just tend to tell you use reasonable under the circumstances. This one actually gives you some controls, which are both good and bad. You can make the argument it's better to leave it up to you, the, the business, to determine what's best. But these things are all basic info sex 101 anyway. If you go to the next slide, we'll wrap this one up. List any breaches whenever you do your annual registration. So this is above and beyond the regular breach notification statute. So if you've got a couple of breaches during the course of the year, when you re-register, you've got to list them above and beyond what you've already notified the state, presumably because the Secretary of State wants to keep track of that. Not sure why they wouldn't just go to the, the Attorney General, but needless to say, you've got to keep track of that. And so the, uh, the Attorney General will enforce this as a unfair deceptive act. No private, private right of action. So unfortunately, it's just the Attorney General that will enforce this. But again, uh, presumably if you complain, uh, if you're being treated unfairly by a broker, they will uh, go and investigate. All right, let's go to Iowa. Iowa, again, interesting. This is first of its kind, to my knowledge. I mean, we already have a federal protection for children, but that applies to children under 13. Here, this is geared for online services and mobile apps that are directed towards K-12 students. And so operating an internet site or a service or an online, perhaps an online teaching site that is directed towards K-12 through and marketed as such, this applies to you. So um, how would they, how does this differ from just a regular website that would do this? Presumably they have some relationship to the school districts. That's the only thing I can think of. They're either a, a perhaps a contractor to the school district and that's how they get K-12 students. That's my guess because I'm not sure what precipitated this, but there was probably some breaches of those third parties. If you go to the next slide, we'll drill down to some of the requirements here. So no targeted advertising, no, pro no profiling based on information you already have. So you could think about if you're a subcontractor to the school district or you're providing something that's based with student information to students, you can't sell their information, can't target them. You have to maintain security practices and procedures, like we've talked about earlier, delete students' information if they request it. So, um, so yeah, it's uncommon. I've, I have yet to see this, so this is first of its kind, but um, it's an interesting um, regulation. In terms of enforcement, though, I was a little hazy on this. If we go to the next slide, I didn't find too much on the enforcement, didn't find anything on private right of action. So presumably it's going to be the Attorney General's office, but um, wasn't, wasn't sure about that. Is there an obligation on firms that buy data to ensure data, the data seller is complying with Vermont law, for example? Uh, read the question to me one more time. I want to make sure I sure. understand it, Doug. Is there an obligation on firms that buy data to ensure that the data mm. seller is complying with Vermont? Oh, you can make the argument that the answer is no, because there's no stated obligation. But here's the problem. If you have actual knowledge that the data broker or whoever sold the data to you was violating the law, then you're in a can of worms because you're essentially buying the data knowing that it, there was something wrong with it. And that's likely going to not be part of a, a security practices and procedures that we would all accept. So the answer is not officially, but unofficially, you're probably going to be stuck holding the bag if you don't investigate these folks, if you find something that's fishy about the sale. Great. No other questions. Okay. 
let's go to, I believe it's California. Yes. Now, if you've probably heard my California CCPA uh, sessions I've done a couple times now this year, so I'm not going to belabor those. I'm only going to touch upon one point of CCPA because I think it's the most important one. And this is the idea that you have to give people an opportunity to opt out of sale of their information. And it applies to just about anyone. So uh, it quite literally is a worldwide application in, in my view. So um, any for-profit entity that does business in California and has either 25 million in sales, touches the data of 50,000 persons or devices or households. So you could have 10,000 people and 10,000 households and 30,000 devices, which isn't difficult, especially if you develop apps for your iPhone or your, or your Android device. Or you get half your revenue from selling the personal information to California residents. That's a pretty low threshold. If you saw my earlier webcast today, there's really no limit to whom that applies to. If we go to the next slide, I'll, I'll show you some of the specifics here that you have to address. One is that consumers got the right at any time to tell you as a business, don't sell my personal data. That's item A. B is that if you do sell personal data of, of customers, you have to, a third party, you've got to give notice to the, to the customer, to the consumer, and give them a right to opt out. And then if you are the third party who got the data from the uh, business that sold it originally, you have to give them the opportunity to opt out as well. So um, it's a heavy burden, and it really is, and this is something that's going to just create utter havoc in a year or so. And those of you that have lived through GDPR, you remember the blizzard notices you got saying, please opt in to my marketing database or whatever it is. You probably got that last May. I know I got it for a whole week last May. That you're going to see the same thing now with California Consumer Privacy Act. So this is something that is going to touch basically everyone in the country because odds are you're doing business with someone in California. And as a consequence, this is, um, this is something that's going to apply to you or your organization if you're a for-profit. A couple yeah. of questions. What are some common sure. examples of selling personal information? Well, you think about if you are, say you're a telecom provider or you're an ISP and you're selling, even if it's not necessarily tra traceable back to you, all the places you're visiting or all the keyword searches you're doing on your phone, what have you, or on your computer. Um, those are things that typically you would sell, or it may be demographic information about your user base. Again, even if it's not necessarily tieable to a specific person, if it's quote-unquote de-identified, it's so easy to re-identify it that it might as well be identifiable to begin with. So unless it's completely aggregated, you're going to find that, uh, third, that organizations that, that just process your data, maybe they're an e-commerce organization and they want to supply to advertisers with the demographics unless you're doing a good job of aggregating that data and it's, it's not difficult to find individuals, then you have the potential where you're going to have to offer those people an opportunity to opt out. And most organizations, believe it or not, that work electronically, perhaps in the business, in the e-commerce business or in telecommunications business will be able to sell this or if they're in the advertising business, they will sell this. So um, there's a lot more organizations to do this than you probably realize. And you'll find that out come a year from now when you start getting hit with all those notices asking you to opt in or giving you the opportunity to opt out is probably a better way to say it. Great. Um, so we have a question from somebody in Brazil. What okay. are the obligations of other countries regarding U.S. data protection laws? For example, this uh, participant's company is in Brazil and they store and process data of Ohio residents, for example. Do they have an obligation to comply with the Ohio law? They do, absolutely. Absolutely. In the same way that we in the U.S. have to comply with GDPR and presumably the Brazilian version of GDPR, which I think just came online recently. Um, in principle, it goes both ways. We in the U.S. have to comply with non-U.S. if we're collecting personal data of non-U.S. folks in, in a given country. And the same is true of those countries in principle have to apply, uh, have to um, enforce or have to be subject to our laws as well. Is it a perfect one-to-one -one or is a, is, a, is a perfect symmetry between those two? Not necessarily. There's a lot of, of politics are involved about giving access to courts to those countries versus our getting access to their courts. But just to simplify things, general rule, if you're collecting personal data of U.S. residents, likely you're subject to our laws and the reverse is likely true as well. Got it. And if the Ohio resident is, for example, living in Brazil, but they're legally a U.S. Ohio resident, the law applies, correct, to that Brazilian well, company? Well, it 
It depends. It depends when you, did you target Ohio or did, did the Ohio resident just show up to live to Brazil, say that they're a student and say they just showed up in Brazil and you started having a relationship with them, you know, uh, provider to customer, then no, it wouldn't apply. So, but now if you targeted that person while they were in Ohio and then they moved, to, like I said, to a student, as a student just going to school in Brazil, then you can make the argument that that data you collected while they were in Ohio is still subject to that law. Got it. Another interesting question popped up. What regarding uh, da- data being sold, but what about a case where the data isn't sold, but is given freely in order for a third party to develop an application with it, such as Facebook or a research group mm-hmm. such as a university? Well, for universities, there is usually a carve out for them because um, for research purposes, if you de identify or aggregate the data, but remember, if, if you don't, if you're just giving that data to third parties, then it's, it's a tough situation because most of these require you to have some compensation for that. If you just simply gave it to a third party, in many cases, the laws don't apply or don't work. And I think this was you know, all too often an oversight. Why you would give that data to Facebook or anyone else, I don't know, but let's just say that you did you run the risk of not violating these laws for perhaps other laws. So the net net of it is that I would be very reticent about just giving data to third parties and presuming that there's not going to be any, any violations of some law, even if it's not these that we're describing here today. Just to wrap up SB 1121, which is CCPA now, state attorney general can bring actions between $2,500 per record in question. So which can get pretty spendy. Um, no private right of action for this. There is a limited private right of action for breaches that aren't remedied, but that's a different discussion. That's uh, California Consumer Privacy Act. If you haven't started getting ready for it, uh, I recommend you do so at the, at the earliest opportunity. It's going to be a, a beast. Let's go to breach notification laws. So these states all now require breach notification, or they may have already required it, but now have really updated the law. For example, Virginia updated to include uh, tax preparers, and we'll we'll touch upon that as we wrap things up. But all 50 U.S. states now and all territories and D.C. all now have have breach notification statutes of one form or fashion. So we'll go right into Alabama here. So this covers Alabama residents. And what's interesting about this is that this also applies to government entities, also applies to nonprofits. So I mentioned earlier that you have to read these statutes pretty thoroughly because just because you're a nonprofit doesn't mean this doesn't apply to you. In many, if not most cases, it does, either by implication or here, Alabama just comes out and says, yep, you're a nonprofit, it applies to you, it applies to the government as well, which is great. We'll go to the next slide, and I'll dig into some of the, the aspects of this. Uh, not surprising at all, um, it requires notification within 45 days of, of a confirmed or suspected breach. Um, you do get the opportunity to review it and see if it causes substantial harm potentially. The problem is with that is that how long is that going to take and do you have the time and the money to go and, and do that investigation? I recommend that if you, if you know there's a breach, I would just report it rather than risk missing the deadline. You do also have to implement security measures, both to yourself and a third party. So here we go, another third party one. Again, copy and pasted likely from some other state statute. Also, data disposal. You've got to have a, a procedure to go and destroy data. So these three, very typical, and this is going to be pretty much table stakes now for all 50 states. And so enforcement, um, up to half a million dollars per breach. So it's not terribly spendy versus, say, CCPA, but potentially could be. And if you've got breaches in multiple jurisdictions or that are uh, for multiple jurisdictions residents more importantly then breaches can get pretty spendy um there's a safe harbor for encrypted data i am not a big fan of these things because the problem is how do you know if data was encrypted at the time it was stolen usually bad guys are pretty sharp about finding data that's not encrypted so i i'm very reluctant to rely on stuff like this let's go to arizona so arizona already had a breach notification statute they updated it added a 45-day notification timeline. Also notice this applies to government entities. Um, although it doesn't apply to law enforcement for whatever reason, apparently applies to nonprofits though. And if we go to the next slide, you'll see that it's not terribly surprising here. 
if you have unencrypted and unredacted computerized data that has personal information, you've got to report within 45 days. There's more than 1,000 individuals. Notify CRAs, credit reporting agencies. Sometimes they're called credit referral or credit reference agencies, and the AG. No notice if a third party, independent third party forensic auditor, and those are the, that's the words that they used in the statute, or law enforcement agency determines that um, there's not been likely harm. Here's the problem with that. Do you really want to spend 45 days with a forensic auditor going through all that and turning up the fact that there is harm? So that's why that's nice to have, but I'm a little bit suspect of the whole thing. It's good for your insurance company if you want to show that uh, the bad guys really did do the things that you said they did, then you may do a forensic auditor for that, but I'm a little suspect that uh, you're going to be able to get that all done in 45 days. So enforced by the AG's office, for knowing and willful violations of the law. So again, it can be um, pretty spendy, uh, not as much as California, but still pretty spendy. Let's uh, jump over to Louisiana. So requires uh, companies to implement information security practices and procedures, destroy personal information, notify the AG within 60 days, and um, applies to um, any business, oh, I'm sorry, or any agency as well. It does that. So it's not just businesses, it's also government entities, which is, I think is a, is a good way to go. And if you go to the next slide, we'll drill down a little bit into this. It's again, table stakes. Um, this was likely copied from another state. Implement security procedures and practices, destroy personal data, and report the breach within 60 days. So nothing unusual um, there. You, In many cases, you get these opportunities where you can determine if there's a likelihood of harm and since you got 60 days here, presumably you could do a pretty thorough investigation. It's the, here's the problem though. If you do the entire investigation, you find out there is harm, then again, you've spent all that resources when you could have been notifying people. So it may be better potentially to just notify them, but that's really up to you and your, your counsel. We'll go to the next slide and we'll close this one out. So this is enforced as an unfair act or practice. So another unfair business or deceptive act like most other states do, no private right of action, unfortunately. Let's go to Oregon. Oregon already had a breach notification law, so it just updated it, gave it a 45-day limit, and said, hey, if more than 250 customers or consumers, notify the AG. What I liked about this, though, is that it said if you're offering free credit monitoring, you can't condition the offer on then selling victim services. So. I know that happened in the past with uh, one of the credit reporting agencies, so Oregon basically put the kibosh on that. So uh, good for you, Oregon. And then we'll go next slide. We'll talk about um, wrapping this up. Um, so uh, implement information security program. Uh, with, what I like about Oregon is that they gave a long list of controls. I was impressed. It was like three different sets of physical, uh, administrative, and technical controls, and, and they really went to town on it. I don't know if that was necessary, but they did. It's nice, but um, I generally like to prefer, you know, choosing my own controls, but here they, they gave a list of things. And again, $500,000 maximum, so not terribly spendy, but still could be part of a larger uh, um, breach. We'll go to South Dakota. This is a breach, a new statute, and applies to an information holder. So any person or business that does a business in the state um, and owns or licenses personal data of uh, South, South Dakota residents. So. Let's go into what they're required to do. You're going to be shocked at this. Report breaches within 60 days. Notify CRAs. Notify the AG if more than 250 are residents. Also um, talks about unauthorized acquisition of unencrypted computerized data and gives a long definition of personal information and protected information. I've seen this happen a couple times. Not sure why states go to this length to have two different classes of protected information, Colorado did the same thing. I'm not sure the motivation for it. If anyone on the, on the webcast knows it, please email me. But this is what they did. So do poke into that and uh, have a look at, at those different things, or at least have your attorneys do it and find out why they've, um, they've done, or at least have a list of the things that they've listed there. So let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about um, uh, enforcement. So enforced as a deceptive act, 10,000 per, uh, per day violation. Residents apparently can pursue a private right of action under the state deceptive act, deceptive practices acts that they have there. Very common in, uh, theme among all these. 
And then finally, uh, we'll wrap up with uh, Virginia. Virginia already had a breach notification statute. This amended it, it expanded it to tax preparers. Again, this is unique as far as I know. I'm not aware of any jurisdiction that specifically cited tax preparation. I think it's a great idea. I mean, and some of you probably, if you were involved with a nonprofit years ago, may have had your um, social security number stolen uh, based upon um, your work with a nonprofit, if you donated money to a nonprofit or what have you. I know a lot of nonprofits got hacked years ago, and so SSNs were stolen as a consequence. It may be that that precipitated this, but it's it's interesting that um, you're adding income tax preparers and the information you would have in a tax return as now protected information. And if we go to the next slide, we'll uh, go into some specifics here. So notify the Department of Revenue, I believe it is, without an unreasonable delay, if you think that um, your um, taxpayer information has been hacked, and then provide them with that list of things there you see on, on Section 2. I won't go into the details, but it's all the print information you can imagine that uh, you'd want to share with the um, law enforcement. And if we go to the next slide, you also have to meet the requirement of the regular breach notification. So say that it was not just tax information, but maybe it was their credit card information or some other personal information they gave you to help prepare for it that was uh, aside from tax information, you'll have to abide by the regular uh, breach notification statute as well. So that's all the states here. Before I go into how to comply, Doug, um, do we have any uh, pending uh, questions here? We do. Um, these could be addressed at the end during the Q&A. They're okay. generic. All right. So let me talk about how to comply. You've probably heard me say this before, but it, it bears repeating. If you don't have a data protection steering committee, now is the time to get one. Because all the things that you're going to need to do to, to account for all of these, these regulations, these statutes, all going to require changes in policies and procedures. And that means you need to have a steering committee. You have to have everyone at the table. So IT and, and IT security, legal compliance, HR, all of them. And if you, um, presumably you're operating in other countries as well, if you've got team members there, you want to get them to participate because of all the local, just cultural issues that you're going to have there. You want to make sure those are accounted for. And that's going to take some time. So please uh, just keep that in mind as you do this. Also determine who's going to lead the security program. Some of these statutes told you flat out, you must have someone to run the program. They may not use the word CISO, but that's essentially what it is. And um, also, uh, I would recommend that you have someone lead security and someone differently leading privacy. Occasionally, I run to CISOs and go, oh, yeah, I'm our DPO. And number one, a CISO can't be a DPO. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten that question. So you really want to have a separate, even if you're not required to have a DPO, just have a separate person lead the privacy program. It's too much to expect the CISO to do all that stuff. And it's, it's more work than they really should be taking on. Let's go to the next slide, Doug. Sure. Scott, a uh, question. Sure. So what legislation is either pending or in effect to hold officers or responsible parties personally liable for data protection lapses at their employer? Boy, to my knowledge, directors and officers are not personally liable yet under any legislation I'm aware of. It's a great question, though, because you think about the post-Enron requirements uh, that became Sarbanes-Oxley and all that, and how there was potential for uh, directors and officers, at least for the CFO and the CEO. To my knowledge, there is no legislation that's, that's pending. I know that in one state, I want to say it was Pennsylvania, the Supreme Court there, I believe, just held that uh, companies do have an obligation to protect the personal information of their employees. But as far as, as above and beyond that, I don't think there's any pending, pending legislation. And even if there was, I'm not terribly cognizant of it because I always wait till it's actually passed into law before I talk about it. Got it. A participant asks, can you expand on why CISO cannot be a DPO? Yeah, because the GPR flat out says, or at least the, I won't say the GDPR says it, but the Article 29 Working Party, which is now the European Data Protection Supervisor or Data Protection Board, says that you cannot have someone be a DPO and also hold another officer position, like a chief marketing officer, chief financial officer, or CEO, it just flat out, you can't do it. So I forget the exact working party document, but it definitely uh, if you Google DPO and um, Article 29 working party, you can find the document and it'll tell you flat out, can't do it. So this person has to be truly independent. They cannot be anything else. And, and as I said earlier, the CISO shouldn't be the DPO anyway, because it's just way too much work. It's like two jobs that you just, one person cannot do. They just wouldn't have the time. 
Great, no other questions, thank you. Okay, so we'll go to the next slide. Rationalize your requirements, what does this mean? R rationalize requirements means that you want to line up all your requirements, look at in each category the most stringent ones and go for those particular controls or requirements to make sure that if you comply with that set, you're complying with everything else. You've likely already done this in other contexts. If you're familiar with something called a crosswalk, sometimes you'll see those where it'll say, I'm mapping ISO 27K to NIST 853 or something like that. Um, you'll see this for a lot of different programs. I know the Path Security Alliance does a great job of a crosswalk where they'll show different regulations and how one maps to another. So I highly recommend rationalizing, looking at all the requirements that are most stringent, and then basing your program around that. Also, um, I would really consider, if you haven't already, and many of you probably are, already considering going to ISO 27K or CSC Top 20, pick one and start the implementation process and have a third party then assess it. If nothing else, if you're a service organization, you're gonna to wanna to have a SOC 2, so great opportunity for that. Even if you're not a service organization, some people will still ask you for your SOC 2, which I know is ridiculous, but I have customers that they get asked for it all the time. Get your data inventory completed. Just, you have to do it because you have to know where the data is. And if you don't know where the data is, I guarantee the bad guys do. They're very adept at finding it. It's most impressive, I gotta say. They're just very resourceful. Identify your third parties because these folks are the ones that are gonna get you in trouble. These are the ones that if you don't police them, they're gonna do stupid stuff with your data, and then you're gonna be holding the bag. And those state statutes, many of them said you've gotta flat out police your third parties. Some say you have to investigate your third parties. So keep that in mind that they're gonna be looking to those kind of standards if there is a, a breach. Um, create mechanisms for reporting and monitoring. So it may be that you have a system where you're using data classification and you're able to get an idea of exactly uh, what data is being potentially misused or is being put in the hands of the wrong people or someone tries to email it, whatever it is, but you want to have a monitoring reporting system so you have an idea of how effective your overall system is. And then constantly improve your data protection program and be ready to defend it in court. You will, even if you don't actually go to trial, you'll definitely be involved in depositions and in producing data in a uh, lawsuit. You really want to make sure your data protection program is ready to roll. And I think that is it, Doug. We've got a whole minute left. So I'm happy to, to uh, answer a couple questions and then um, we'll catch the rest on email or perhaps we can post them. There are quite a few more questions and we apologize that we couldn't get to your questions, but we will respond to you directly by email, we'll also uh, create a blog that uh, has a list of all the questions and answers. Again, I wanna thank everybody for joining us. We hope to see you at, at our next webinar. The webinars are generally bi-weekly, every two weeks. And thank you very much, Scott. You're most welcome. Have a great day, bye.